Hello, everybody. Um, this is uh, Dr. Shashi Kivan. Thank you all for joining the meeting. So uh, this will be a... sorry, just a second. Sorry. So this will be uh, um, one of the first in the series of uh, Dermpath lectures, which will be quiz based. So before we actually start, I'd like you all, whoever has joined right now, to please, uh, if you're interested in the quiz, um, to participate in the quiz, please uh, have two devices ready. One should be uh, a, a laptop and one a phone, or you can have two phones as well. Doesn't matter because it will be difficult for you to um, see the lecture and participate in Kahoot in the same device because you need to log in uh, through the Chrome browser for both. Or uh, if you're using an app, Kahoot app, then still it'll be difficult for you to, to switch between the app and Chrome browser. So I suggest you have two devices. You can manage with one device by switching between the screens, but it can be a bit difficult. But if you're planning to uh, do that, um, if you're planning to have two devices anyway, please download the Kahoot app on your phone, which would be much easier. But still, if you don't have the Kahoot app and you don't want to download it, you can still go to um, Chrome and type kahoot.it uh, and that should take you to the Kahoot app. Um, and I'll give you the further instructions as we go along. I'll hand it over to Dr. Lalit Gupta, who will give a brief introduction about uh, IADVL Academy and how this program will go through. Thank you, Dr. Sashi. And uh, a very good evening to one and all. Uh, first of all, on behalf of Academy, I compliment the SIG on dermatopathology and the Dermatopathological Society of India, who, as a joint venture, they are conducting this very wonderful activity of dermatopathology lectures. And this is unique in the sense that this is not only a didactic lecture, it has a kind of interactive uh, quiz-based uh, lecture involving all the participants. So this is certainly going to be very interesting, I'm sure. So congratulations, Dr. Sashi, uh, for uh, being the quiz master. And we have six of such uh, dermatopath lectures. This is going to be the first uh, lecture and this is basically on the basic dermatopathology how you read how do you go about the slides reading the slides and it's it's a kind of backbone lecture for all of you to you know attend uh on behalf of idwell academy i also take this opportunity to thank our very dynamic ec led by dr vijay jawar and dr dinesh devraj who have been very supportive to all our academic endeavors uh, that we are, you know, holding, and uh, uh, thanks to them. My sincere thanks to all the uh, participants also who will be finding their time out. Particularly, it, it is going to be very useful for the uh, residents. Uh, uh, as Dr. Sashi mentioned, that you need to, you know, uh, download the Kahoo app uh, from your system from the, your Google Play Store and uh, you have to log in through two devices or switch between the two devices so that you can interact with him directly. So this is a unique feature of this exercise that the participants will be able to you know, reach to the quiz master or the lecturer directly and interact in a better manner. So this is the first uh, of its kind, and I'm sure this is going to be a very interesting one. So not taking much of your time, I again hand over the proceedings to the quiz master, Dr. Sashi, for the further, you know, taking you to the uh, interactive uh, lecture. Uh, I hope you would all enjoy this academic feast and thank you very much, uh, everyone. Over to you, Dr. Sashi. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. And uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for your guidance and help with this set with setting this up. And I'd like to at this outset also thank Glodama who have been instrumental in sponsoring the Kahoot app and also the Zoom platform and giving us this platform to interact. Uh, thank you, sir. So without much ado, I'll start my presentation. I'm just going to share the screen in a second. Um, just one minute. So hopefully everybody can see the screen. Um, is my screen visible and I'm audible well, sir? Yes, you are. Okay. Please go ahead. Right. So, um, yes, this uh, quiz basically, uh, the first one is going to be based on basic dump path. And what I'm hoping to cover here 
is uh, the basics of dermatopathology, how to read a slide, and what is the normal anatomy in the skin. Uh, second, right. So uh, these are the Kahoot quiz rules. The quiz is open to all PGs and consultants. So a lot of you have asked questions as to how to join the quiz. Uh, all participants have to make arrangements for a good laptop and a fast and stable internet connection. If there is a break in internet connection, you will miss the questions asked during this period as we will not be able to wait or go back for you, okay? And ideally, log in through two devices. We've been mentioning that from the beginning. And uh, if you prefer do the, doing this on a smartphone, please download the Kahoot app where, from the Apple or Play Store where it will be much easier to do it. Now, make sure if you're participating in the quiz, please log in with your full names, including surname for identification, because if your name is, say, Rohit, you may, there may be two Rohits in the, in the audience, so we can't really identify you unless you have your full name there. And uh, yes, there will be a prize for the winners and we'll announce that at the end. All the questions would be multiple choice questions and there will be only be one correct answer. So don't worry if you, uh, and, and, you know, don't um, worry if you think there are two or three answers, just choose the best answer amongst them. Oops, okay. Now, how does scoring in Kahoot work? If you've never used Kahoot before, each question is marked out of thousand points. The maximum points are scored by the fastest correct answer. Say a question is allotted 20 seconds, which most of the questions are. The person who answers at the fifth second will score more than the person who answers at the 10th second. Okay. There is also a street bonus. So when you get two or more answers correct in a row, you earn an additional 100 points per answer up to a maximum of 500 bonus points. Okay. But after five uh, streaks, you don't get additional 500 points. 500 is a maximum. Now, if you get the question wrong, the streak resets itself to zero and you stop earning bonus points unless you get a streak again. Wrong answers or not attempting gets you zero points. There's no negative marking. So however fast you respond. So if you don't know the answer at all, still you want to guess, please guess fast so that you get, if you get the correct answer, you'll at least get more marks. Okay. So without much ado, let me start the presentation. Um, and this will give you time to also, so before this quiz starts, there are a few slides to give you time to, you know, download the app if you want to. Now, before we know what is abnormal in skin, we need to know what is normal, right? For example, if you see these kind of goats hanging around in trees uh, in India, you may think they're drunk. But these are actually claven hoof goats in Morocco, uh, which climb argan trees and to eat the argan fruit there, uh, or the seed actually. So, Normal depends on the location and uh, depends on the environment in which that particular uh, you know situation that where the inflammation pathology is in. So that is why it's very important for us to learn what is normal. So let's first start with the basic anatomy of the skin. Now, when we talk about the epidermis, we all know it has a basal layer, and I'm going to be very basic because I know that basics are not taught well in in uh, in, in graduation. So. The epidermis starts off with the basal layer where you have a basal layer of columnar cells. One in every eight cells or so is a melanocyte, which is a vacuolated cell, okay? So these vacuolated cells are melanocytes. They have dendrites if you look at them uh, microscopically, but you don't see the dendrites on HNE &E staining, okay? Now, these columnar cells become more flattened or squamoid as they grow up, okay? Then you have the spinous layer, and then you have a granular layer. So granular layer is where these cells gradually, the columnar cells become more cuboidal and squamoid. Squamoid refers to this polyhedral, polygonal appearance. Now you can see the desmosomes in between the keratinocytes here and that's why this is called the spinous layer. Now some of these cells have a brown pigment. This is called the melanin cap. So when the melanocytes release their melanin, these uh, the melanosomes, these melanosomes are taken up by the keratinocytes and the keratinocytes keep the melanin as a cap on top of their um, surface. So the UV rays, when they hit the skin, they are the, the nuclei are protected from the UV rays by this melanin. Okay, so this is called a melanin cap. You can see that well here in this section. Now, as the cells mature up, they tend to lose their nuclei. The nuclei become more flattened, okay? And this keratohyaline granules, et cetera, leads to the formation of this granular layer. After the stratum granulosum, the nuclei are completely lost. And then you have the stratum lucidium, which is only found in certain areas of the skin. 
after the stratum lucidum is the most uh, well the superficial area of the epidermis which is called the stratum corneum okay now this is called the basket weave appearance it's like a basket weave so this is a normal orthokeratosis ortho means normal keratosis means keratin uh, um, so this is orthokeratosis or normal basket weave orthokeratosis okay now, in some places, for example, in pressure sites, for example, acral areas like the palms, soles, etc., this basket weave is compressed due to pressure forces. And when this happens, you have compact orthokeratosis. Okay. But on the face, on the limbs, on, on normal areas which are not subject to pressure, if you're seeing compaction, that is abnormal. So you may see that in, in psoriasis or other spongiotic dermatosis, you may find it. So, but if you're uh, if you're seeing that on acral skin, skin, if you're seeing compact hyperkeratosis on acral skin, that is completely normal. Okay. So we've now learned about the basal layer, the spinous layer, the granular layer, the stratum lucidium and stratum corneum, and we've seen the melanocytes sites here. Now, this here is a, a Langerhans cell sitting here, slightly east of filic cytoplasm. There is nothing else that um, probably is confusing here. So we move on to the next slide. So this is just demonstrating the stratum spinosum. So let's do a demonstration now. Um, if you've not already done, please log on to kahoot.it. And the pin to participate in the quiz is this 2147401. It's 2147401. That's, uh, please make a note of it. 2147401. So when you log on to kahoot.it, it'll ask for a pin, and that's what you what you need to enter. If you download the app, this is what the app screenshot may look like. Click on join here. And when you click on join, it'll ask for the game pin, and that's what you need to enter there again. Now, uh, please start entering the game pin if you've not already done so. So you enter, this is a dummy, this is a dummy video I put in a while earlier. So that's not the pin you need to enter. The pin you need to enter I've already given earlier. Enter your nick, the full name. I told you it's not a nickname you want to enter. If you want to participate in the quiz, please enter your full name. Okay. And when you enter your full name, this is what you're going to see. Now, uh, let me go on to Kahoot. I see that a lot of people have already joined. Excellent. Some of you have put in a few pseudonyms, but if you want to participate in the quiz for sure, please uh, put in your um, full name so that we can identify you for the prizes later. Okay. So I'll give some time for you to log in. This uh, will be still open. There are already 71 people who have joined and I'm sure more people will be joining in. Um, let me go on to the um, presentation. Um, so you can still join in, don't worry. And uh, you've seen the quiz pin. If you want the pin again, I'll give it to you in a second. So once you're ready, the first question when it starts, remember, some of you may only see this. You'll only see this rather than the option. So this will be one, this is two, this is three, and this is four. You may not have one, two, three, four, but you'll see these symbols. So this is one, two, three, four. If you want to press the options, this is what you need to do. This is one, option one, this is option two, this is option three, and this is option four. So don't be confused if you don't see anything there like one, two, three, four on your apps. Okay, so this is the pin again. If you want to join, it's 2147401. Okay, now let's go on to uh, the first trial question. Now, don't uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you get this wrong because it's only a trial question so that you can, uh, um, enter, you can um, answer it. So um, here is a typical case of, I'm sure you all know, this is a case of psoriasis. So the option here is option three. This is one, two, three, four, if you go with that. So, so yes is the answer. So how do you select that? I'll first start the quiz and you can go on. I'm sure there'll be other people joining in, but this is just a trial session. So when, because we're short of time, we'll still start the thing and others can join in. This is the first one will only be um, a trial thing. So here you can see, this is, uh, we we'll start with the first one is just a poll. It's a trial question. What is the diagnosis? So here you can see, you choose, um, obviously you can choose any of them if you want, but the answer is psoriasis here, and this is just a trial question. So put in your answers there. And once you put in your answers, when the time is up, you have 20 seconds. So it's given us, some of you have still put in the wrong answer, but it's given us a poll as to how many people have answered which one, okay? So this is just a trial question. 
we'll go on to the actual question in a second. Okay, so this is the actual question. So look at the slide and um, identify the features that are being shown here. Uh, let me just minimize this. Uh, the Zoom thing is coming in my way. I'm just minimizing that. Sorry about that. Okay, so what is the slide showing? Okay, so look at the features in the slide and uh, let me know what you think, what the slide is showing. Your options are, look at your, I hope you've looked at the slide properly. Look at the top from the top to bottom, look at it properly, look at the keratinocytes, look at the stratum corneum, lucidium epiphany, granulosum and spinosum. You're not seeing the basal layer here. Sorry. Okay. So what is the slide showing your options are coilocytosis, parakeratosis, basket weave orthokeratosis, or checkerboard pattern of alternating ortho and parakeratosis. Okay. That's the slide there. Okay. Now, let me uh, start the question. So your question, your quiz starts now. What is the slide showing? You have 20 seconds. Got more than hundred answers, and majority of given of you have given the right answer. The right, right answer is indeed paracaltosis, and I'll explain why why the answer is so. So this is uh, not the basket view pattern. This is actually compact hyperkeratosis. This is paracaltosis here. So paracaltosis happens when the nuclei are not extruded. So normally I told you, as the epidermis matures the nucleus should actually become smaller and smaller. You should have in the granular area and should be completely lost here. But what is happening here is the nuclear retained. You can see these flat nuclei here. This is what we call parakeratosis. Parakeratosis is seen when the epidermis matures rapidly and the nuclei have not got enough time to be extruded out. Okay. So this can happen in conditions like psoriasis. So you need to understand the pathology. Why does parakeratosis happen? Because the epidermal turnover is very high and the nuclei have not got enough time to disintegrate. So when does this happen? This can happen in psoriasis. In spongiotic dermatosis, it can happen. It can also happen in malignancies like acne keratosis, squamous cell carcinoma, etc. You may see parakeratosis. Lichen planus generally not because it's a chronic slow disease. And in chronic disease, generally you don't see parakeratosis to that extent. Now, why are you seeing parakeratosis here and not here? Because after all, the nuclei should go from here to here, right? Why are you seeing that here? This is actually normal skin. So once the this is a disease that has been biopsied in a later stage, it's a post-inflammatory stage. So here you're seeing that the epidermis is also normal, right? You're not seeing any pathology here. This is a post-inflammatory stage that the epidermis has been biopsied. So you're seeing remnants of the parakeratosis that happened previously. And in fact, this is normal skin that is growing out. This is probably acre skin actually going with the thickness of the stratum corneum, okay? Um, let us go to Kahoot. And the reason I want to do that is so that I can see the leaderboard. So the leaderboard right now, Suvida Kamath is on top with 976 points, presumably because uh, you've answered the quickest, followed by Subhashree, Anchal Bansal, Rahul Nayak, and Prame Deshpan, okay? So out of uh, 100 and 100 so participants, this is the leaderboard right now. All right, let's go to the next uh, slide. So why is it not uh, coilocytosis, uh, right? Why is no? I should explain that also. This is not coilocytosis. There are no coilocytes here. Coilocytes look quite different. These are just spaces within the, uh, the compact paracelsus. This is not coilocytes. These are not, there are no coilocytes here either. Why is this not a checkerboard pattern? Checkerboard should be alternating between the vertical and horizontal section. So this is a checkerboard pattern of PRP. This is from textbook, not my case. But you can see here, there is paracytosis here, no paracytosis here. There is parakeratosis here, no parakeratosis here. So if the parakeratosis and orthokeratosis are alternating in both vertical and horizontal directions, that's when we call it the checkerboard pattern, okay? And that's not what we're seeing in the case that I presented. It's not basket weave because basket weave should be loose, like in the case that I discussed uh, in the initial section. This is basket weave uh, hyperkeratosis. It should be like a basket weave. It's not basket weave in this particular case. It's more compact, okay? So um, moving on to the next question, which of these statements is true, okay? A, stratum corneum is absent in the mucosae. Two, mellocytes are absent in the oral cavity. 
three. Stratum malfigi is another term for stratum spinosum. Four, stratum lucidium is not normally seen in the acral areas. I'll give you two seconds to digest the question. Okay. Anyway, the question will be visible when we go to Kahoot anyway. So let's start. So majority of you have got it right again. Stratum corneum is indeed absent in mucose. Melanocytes are not absent in the oral cavity. They are present, but fewer in numbers. That's why you have uh, mucosal melanosis. Okay, then the basis for this is, is the increase in melanocytes or melanocyte uh, melanin production. Stratum malfigi is actually refers to stratum basal. Actually, the basal layer is and the term uh, uh, is, is called the stratum malfigi. Though some people also use it to imply both the stratum basal and stratum spinosum, but stratum malfigi strictly actually refers to the stratum basal. Now, I did mention uh, stratum lucidium earlier, but I didn't tell you where it is present. I told you it's only present in some areas. Stratum lucidium is only found in the acral areas, actually. In most cases, it's found in the acral areas. It's normally not found in, in uh, non-acral skin. It's only in thicker skin that you actually tend to find stratum lucidium. Okay, So not normally seen is actually false. So the correct answer is stratum corneum is absent in mucosa because mucosa is non-keratinized epithelium and hence stratum corneum is absent there. Let's look at the leaderboard now. So the leaderboard right now still leading is Suvida Kamat uh, with uh, 1947 points. I told you each question is 1000 points followed by Soumya Navula, Dark Knight, whoever you are, uh, Dr. Vujwal and Dr. Aishwarya. Okay, excellent. Now, therefore, uh, let's move on to the types of stratified squamous epithelium in the skin. I told you there are two types. One is keratinized and non-keratinized. Non-keratinized refers to the mucosal epithelium, which usually does not have a stratum corneum. Now, because it doesn't have a stratum corneum, the, the mucosal layer, though diagrammatically it looks a bit different, the mucosal epithelium tends to be thicker than the normal skin. Because it doesn't have a stratum corneum, the, the epidermis has to protect itself. Therefore, the cells are much thicker. Okay, the, the, They have uh, much, much many more layers than the normal skin. Though diagrammatically this looks reverse, uh, just ignore the diagram for now. Now it still has a basal layer. The spinous layer is, is actually uh, not present or it, it's not visible. They don't see the spines in between the keratinocytes. But you don't see the keratinocytes. Often in mucosal skin, this is the actual representation. The cells are glycogenated. Okay, And that is how you identify mucosal epithelium because it's often glycogenated and there is no stratum corneum. You can see the cells, though they become uh, much more flattened as they go up, they don't have a stratum corneum per se. Okay, The nuclei are retained to the end. So this is the basic difference between mucosal and non-mucosal epithelium. So mucosal skin is non-keratinized, therefore it's thicker. Upper layers are nucleated. It has a faster turnover as well. And therefore there are more visible mitosis. That's what in the diagram, um, this particular mitotic figure is trying to represent. In mucosal epithelium, there's a higher turnover. Often glycogenated with pale cytoplasm and larger cells, and the retic ridges are flatter. So, what this comes to my next point in uh, anatomy of the epidermis is the retic ridges. What are these retic ridges? So, the epidermal ridges fit into the dermal papillae, and that's how the epidermis anchors itself to the dermis, right? So, these are called the retic ridges. So, this is what they look like in cross section. Now, these are absent in the mucosa, or they can also be absent in uh, inflammatory conditions where the cell turnover is high. And then the epidermis becomes much more flattened, especially in interface dermatosis, where the basal layer is damaged, the epidermal retigages are near or less completely lost. The, the, it's called effacement of retigages when that happens. So this is an example of mucosal epithelium. Um, I told you the epidermis is fairly flat without any visible retigages, though occasionally you can see some here. Okay, so here's the next quiz. Uh, hands on your Kahoot app. Which of the following is true? Okay, read the question properly. Which of the following is true? Non-keratinized mucosal epithelium can readily transform into keratinizing type in some situations. That's option one. Option two, linea alba is diagnosed in histology primarily by the absence of melanocytes. Number three, in mucosa, lamina propria corresponds to the subcutis in the skin. Or number four, in mucosa, 
submucosa corresponds to the dermis of the skin. So let's uh, go on to the Kahoot app and start the quiz. This is question number three, though it says four because one of the three. Still, the majority have given, given the right answer, though quite a few have given the wrong answers. So, non keratinase can definitely transform to keratinoids in, in places of trauma. Um, for example, in, in linea alba, uh, the epidermis can become keratinized. Linea alba basically occurs because of the uh, place where the both teeth, uh, you know, they may crunch and, you know, make the buccal mucosa thicken there. There is no absence of melanocytes, though the line is white, it's just thickening of the epidermal uh, mucosa, the epithelium there. Um, lamina propria actually refers to the dermis. The area immediately beneath the epithelium is epidermis. Epithelium and the mucosa is called the lamina propria. It refers to the dermis. And subcutis refers to the submucosa, actually. Uh, so it's reverse here. Submucosa is not the dermis. It's the lamina propria that's the dermis. So these two are interchanged. So these two are false. The only correct answer here is non keratinized can transform into keratinized epithelium. Okay. Let's look at the leaf on the board now. Suvita Kamath is still on top. Uh, Ujwal is second. Dr. Aishwarya Rai third. Vichita Seta and Guna Balaji are coming up. So let's go on to the next um, question or next part of the um, talk. So example of keratinized mucosa. Keratinized mucosa is masticatory mucosa, hard palate and gingiva, for example, are keratinized. Okay. So wherever the there is much more trauma, the epithelium can become keratinized. So this is a this is a diagrammatic representation of the mucosa epithelium. You have a superficial layer, intermediate layer, basal layer, lamina propria, which essentially is a dermis, and then the submucosa and then the muscle. Right. So this is the normal skin showing you the papillary dermis. So the dermis is divided into two parts in the normal skin, which is what we're interested in. Um, so in the normal skin, they have the papillary dermis, which the collagen is much more finer and looks more homogeneous. And then the reticular layer where the collagen is much more looser, and you can see that there are some gaps between the collagen fibers here, okay? Much more, slightly thicker fibers, papillary dermis, thinner fibers, much more coerced together, not much gaps, not many gaps between the collagen fibers, okay? So this is the basic um, the anatomy of the dermis. But when you take thicker sections, you can see that the papillary layer is very small and the reticular layer is actually quite huge. And also within the dermis, you tend to see other adnexal structures. This is the cross section of the hair follicle. And you're seeing here sebaceous glands opening into the hair follicle. And I'll go into the details, uh, anat anatomy of the hair follicle later. Here you're actually seeing in the deep dermis, you're seeing these sweat glands here. Sweat glands lined by a double layer of cuboidal cells. Okay, so these are the sweat glands you're seeing here. And a sweat duct comes out of that and goes into the epidermis. And you're seeing the duct here in cross section. And it goes out and opens into the epidermis somewhere there, which you're not seeing because that cross section is not covering that. And these are terminal hair follicles, which you're seeing here as well. These are all cross section, remember. So the hair follicle is, is not exactly straight. So you because you're only seeing a cross section, you're seeing only a part of the hair follicle. So let's go to the adnexal structures in the skin. There are mainly two types of glands in the skin. One is the eccrine glands, which are sweat glands, which open directly into the epidermis. I told you that just now. Then we have the epocrine glands, which open into the hair follicle. And the two types of epocrine glands that we actually know, one is the sebaceous glands, and the other is the epocrine sweat glands. And uh, epocrine sweat glands are usually present in the axilla and the anogenital region. Uh, axilla and the anogenital region are the common place where, oops, are, are the, where these are present. Oops, sorry. Uh, okay. So this is a diagrammatic representation of for the same thing. You can see an epocrine gland here. Oops, sorry, the share is gone. Um, sorry, my screen was interrupted. I hope you can uh, see it. Yeah, now. Arvind, is it okay now? Sir, it is working. No problem. Yeah, yeah. Share is there. Okay. So uh, you can see here the eccrine gland here, diagrammatically represented, opening directly onto the surface. Um, and here you're seeing the apocrine sweat gland opening just above where the uh, sebaceous gland opens. So this is a sebaceous gland which opens into the hair follicle here while the apocrine sweat gland opens slightly above that, okay? You can see that diagrammatically represented here. So question four, 
The following areas of the skin lack sweat glands, except this is an easy question. Hopefully, you can answer that. Earlobe, external ear canal, nail bed, or gland spinis. Okay. So the following areas of skin lack sweat glands, except. So you'll have that in your Kahoot uh, thing anyway. So I'm going to start the quiz. Be ready. Unfortunately, um, only um, a few of you have given the right answer. The right answer is the earlobe. If you think about the earlobe, does sweat, doesn't it? So I said except. So this area should have sweat glands. Okay. External ear canal doesn't have sweat glands. You don't sweat inside the ear. Uh, the inside the ear doesn't actually sweat. Nail bed doesn't sweat. Glands, penis doesn't sweat, but earlobe does sweat. Okay. External ear canal usually contains uh, and the internal usually contains ceruminous glands, but not actually sweat glands. Earlobe is the right answer here. So let's see who's uh, given the right answers. So Soumya Narula is uh, now leading. Um, nine players just dropped their answer streak of three, unfortunately. It looks like this question broke a few um, players' streak. Okay, let's move on to the next part of the quiz. So this is a, uh, the, the uh, live demonstration of the sweat gland, the sweat duct opening onto the surface of the skin. Okay, this I just saw this slide nicely demonstrated and I put it. And this is uh, again showing the acrine glands. And this is showing a close-up of the acrine glands in the deep dermis. So you don't normally see this in the superficial dermis. You only see this in a deep dermis. And you're seeing a double layer of cuboidal cells here. And this is what an acrine gland looks like. So you can't confuse this. There are only a few um, spaces that are round in the dermis. One is uh, blood vessels. And the second is these acrine glands. You don't normally see anything else lined by cells in the skin. Okay. So this is more of a clinical question based on the anatomy you've just studied and also some of your anatomy you've learned and some of the pathogenesis you've learned earlier in your uh, post-graduation, hopefully. So the pathogens of Fox Fordyce disease may involve all of the following except one, keratin plug in the follicular in front of bloom, occlusion of the apocrine duct, occlusion of the apoecrine duct, which I've not discussed, but if you've read it, you would probably know, and I'll discuss it later, or four, occlusion of the sebaceous gland. Okay, so let's start the quiz now. You've got it right, actually. So, occlusion of the uh, uh, apocrine duct or apocrine duct may happen. And so, the first thing actually is a keratin plug in the hair follicle, which causes uh, occlusion of the apocrine uh, of the apocrine duct. That is the main thing because Fox Fordyce disease, as you know, is also referred to as apocrine malaria. And apocrine ducts, uh, apocrine sweat ducts, usually, um, not the sebaceous duct, it's apocrine sweat ducts because we said malaria. First, there is a keratin plug in the hair follicle, following which you have uh, the sweat retention within the hair follicle. Now, apoecrine ducts are rarely described. They refer to uh, they're, they're referred to um, um, they're, they're sort of ducts, which are glands that look like eccrine ducts, but have apocrine secretion, apocrine type of secretion. I hope you know what apocrine type of secretion is. I don't have a photo to demonstrate that, but you have this decapitation secretion. So eccrine ducts don't know, or eccrine glands don't, don't, don't normally decapitate, but apocrine glands do. But if you have an eccrine gland, which directly opens onto the surface, not onto the, not into the hair follicle, but has a decapitation type of secretion like an apocrine duct, that is called an apocrine duct. And that can also be involved in uh, apocrine malaria, which is what is Fox Fordyce disease. Okay, let's see who's uh, leading the board now. Soumya Nagala is still on the top, followed by Savi Aneja, Desh, uh, Suvida Kamath is now back. And, and now Shiba M. Jacob is number fifth. Three players just dropped their answer streak of four. It's a combo breaker, right? Let's see. <clears throat> so, um, 
this pink structure, which is asking for help, looks like it's uh, trying to lift its arms up and uh, trying to attach itself to something else. Is actually a, uh, is actually a muzzle. So this is what a muzzle fiber looks like. This is the erectus pylori muzzle. So we're still dis discussing adnexal structures in the skin. We've discussed uh, glands. I briefly mentioned about hair follicle, but then you have this erectus pylori muzzle, which also attaches itself to the hair follicle, and that's what I'm trying to demonstrate here. Okay, so this again shows you sebaceous glands attaching themselves to the hair follicle. Now, why I put this close up of the sebaceous gland is so that you're not confused with the fat cell. Sebaceous glands normally have, uh, sebaceous cells normally have a foamy cytoplasm, but the nucleus is central. It's not eccentric. So see the foamy cytoplasm here. See the foamy cytoplasm here. See the foamy cytoplasm here. But the nucleus is central. Okay. So a central nucleus with foamy cytoplasm is suggestive of a sebaceous gland. However, in fat cells, the nucleus is eccentric. There is no foamy cytoplasm. All the fat has been dissolved during processing. There is no foamy cytoplasm. Okay. So that's the essential difference between a fat cell and a sebaceous gland, which sometimes can cause confusion. Um, and I thought I'll discuss that. Another structure you may see in the dermis is this pink uh, wavy structure here, which is a nerve fiber on high power. You can uh, see appreciated much better. And you have this spindle shaped nuclei which also tend to wave, okay? So this wavy structure is a nerve fiber. Often when you're seeing inflammation on nerve fiber, of course, you have been taught, I hope, to consider Hansen's, but that's not the only, only situation where you may see perineural inflammation. And this is a cross-section of the infundibulum. I'm showing you to demonstrate the hair follicle here. So this is what infundibulum looks like. Um, and uh, lower down, you have the other parts of the hair follicle. Anyway, now we want to go on to the next uh, quiz question. The question is, hair follicles are absent in all of the following except. Your options are glans penis, palms, foreskin, vermilion border of the lip. And the question is except, remember. Okay. So let's move on to the Kahoot app and start. You have got it right, but I'm um, surprised that still some of you have got it wrong. Foreskin does indeed have, uh, especially in the outer part, not the inner side, outer part does have hair follicles. Glands, penis, palms are obviously devoid, and Birmingham border of the lip doesn't have any hair follicles. Uh, I don't know why some of you thought that, but that doesn't have hair follicles either. And let's see what the leaderboard looks like now. Soumya Navila is still on top, followed by now Suveda Kamat, who's back in second position. Guna Balaji, Ujwalan. Now we've got a new name, Alaka. So uh, lots of questions to go. So um, please do, don't get disappointed. Um, please do try. Let's hope to see your name in the leaderboard in the next question. So this is a cross section of the hair follicle, which I thought I'd demonstrate. This is the infundibulum and the infundibulum, this is what this is what the hair follicle looks like. You The inner root sheath is more or less absent here. You don't really see it, it becomes very thin. You're mainly seeing the outer root sheath and the hair shaft inside. Sometimes you may not see the hair shaft um, because it may be lost during processing. It's quite a thick structure. So it may float away. So you may not see a hair shaft. That doesn't mean the hair follicle is empty. The hair shaft may just be uh, lost just during processing. The inner root sheath is much more thicker near the isthmus. Isthmus refers to the area between the insertion of the erectus pylori muscle and the infundibulum. This refers to the isthmus. Where the erectus pylori muscle attaches itself, that's called the bulge area where you see stem cells, okay? Um, so uh, when you go deeper down, you see the stem actually has a lower segment and um, you see the uh, bulb. Now, um, the sorry, the, the stem actually, uh, the, the lower segment has a stem and the bulb. The bulb on cross-section looks like so. Um, you see a lot of glycogenated cells in the in a bulb and uh, higher up the inner root sheet is not disintegrated but as you go up if you see this the inner root sheet starts to disintegrate near down the isthmus area here the inner root sheet is quite intact okay 
and uh, the hair, hair shaft may or may not be seen. It's seen quite well here because here the hair shaft is attached to the inner root sheath. You don't often tend to miss it when you see the deeper sections. Okay, I won't go into the details, but hair goes through cycles as we all know. You have the anagen, catagen, and telogen phase. Now, uh, I have to mention this because this is the non-cycling, the upper segment is a non-cycling part of the hair. This part does not cycle. Cycle in the sense, this does not go through anagen, catagen, and telogen. It's only the lower part below the isthmus, or sorry, below the, uh, yeah, below the isthmus and the bulge area that cycles. So as the hair cycles, the root, the hair bulb actually regresses, becomes like so. And when this happens, you see the, the inner root sheath becomes, it shrivels, becomes eosinophilic. And this is the catagen phase. And as it further thins out and thins out, you have this telogen follicle, which is which looks like a star shaped on cross section. Now, if you take a section here, you may not know, know, see any difference because this is a non-cycling phase, okay? Only when you see a section down below, you be able to identify the anagen, catagen, and telogen phases properly. Okay, this is the follicular stella which is left behind when you uh, see the lower uh, half in cross section. Okay, so this is again demonstrating the same in cross section, but here I put this to show you a vellus hair follicle. This is a vellus hair follicle where the diameter of the hair shaft is very small. It actually is equal to or smaller than the inner root sheet. That's how we identify vellus hair follicles from the Terminal hair follicle. So this is a terminal hair follicle where the hair shaft, which is probably this big, is much larger than the inner root sheet. The diameter of the hair shaft is much larger than that of the inner root sheet. Well, here you can see that the diameter is actually equal to or smaller than the inner root sheet. This is a vellus hair follicle. This we term as intermediate hair follicle, uh, which is somewhere in between the terminal and the vellus follicle. Okay. And this you're seeing a uh, Elatoris pylori muscle in cross section again. This is a transverse section of the hair follicle, which I tend to do when analyzing uh, hair biopsies. I tend to do transverse sections, which are much more useful than vertical sections. Right, here's question number seven. Massive catagen telogen shift, that is greater than 50% shift of hair follicles from the anagen to the catagen telogen phase. Now, normally, Catagen and telogen hair should not constitute more than 20% of the hairs. In fact, around 10 to 15% is enough. Up to 20% may be seen in some cases. But when more than 50% of cases of, of sections of uh, hair follicles in the section have gone into catagen and telogen phase, this is suggestive of one condition here. And I'll start the quiz so that you can pop in your answers. So be ready. More than 50% CT should just begin. out of 120 have got it right. I haven't really explained the answer to you. So you would only know this if you've read it in a book or given the answer by luck. Now, telogen effluvium, again, about 20% is the answer. It won't see a massive 50% shift. Now, if you think about the pathogens of Elobishi areata, you see a swarm of bees appearance, right? You read about it when you're, uh, when you're reading about Elobishi areata. Where is a swarm of bees appearance? It's around the hair bulb. And often alopecia areata, the entire hair follicles, the, all the hair follicles in a particular area are involved, right? So when all the hair follicles have their bulbs destroyed, all of them suddenly go into the catagen phase. Okay. So it's easy to understand when you understand the pathogenesis. So when all the hair follicle bulbs are attacked at the same time, all of them go into the catagen phase at the same time, catagen or telogen phase. So therefore, more than 50% of the follicles at any point are in the catagen or telogen phase. And that happens only in alopecia areata. It doesn't happen in any other condition because in no other condition do all the hair bulbs get attacked at the same time in one particular area. Okay. I hope you, that's why it's very important to understand the anatomy, the histology, the basic histology of uh, any part of the skin, uh, whether it's a hair, nail, or the normal skin or mucosa to understand the pathogenesis. And if you understand the pathogenesis, it's much easier to correlate the two. I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, changes now in the scoreboard. Soumya Nagala is still on top. Excellent. Well done. Followed by Suvida Kamat and Guna Balaji. The top three names remain the same. Arvind Des, I think I've seen before. And now they've got a new name, Atreyo Chakal. 
So Manasi Sherwani has a street with five correct answers in a row, but you're slightly lower down somewhere. But I'm sure if you get the next answer correct, hopefully we should see you um, in the leaderboard. All right. So I hope I've explained the normal anatomy now. We have seen most of the normal structures, uh, apart from the fat, which I've also shown you, actually. Uh, nerve fiber I've shown you, vascular plexus, uh, I mentioned it. So now we move on to the types of inflammatory cells in the skin. Now, basic dermatology, I can go on for uh, a few hours. I've got a lot of slides, but hopefully we'll cover some of them. I'm, I'm sorry, the quiz will extend for about 15, 20 minutes, uh, more than the scheduled time of nine o'clock, but hopefully you won't be bored. So different types of inflammatory cells in the skin. Uh, we have eosinophils, plasma cells, lymphocytes, histiocytes, mast cells, neutrophils. This is a foamy histiocyte and fibrocytes as well, which can sometimes be there in inflammatory conditions and non-inflammatory conditions. So this is, a this is a section demonstrating quite a few of these cells. Now I'll start off with the easiest, which is this round blue cell with no cytoplasm, this is the lymphocytes. This is very easy to identify in sections because it's a round blue cell with no cytoplasm, okay? This is the name, this is actually also very easy. This is, you have an eosinophilic cytoplasm with a spectacle shaped nucleus, an eosinophil, I'm sure most of you would be easily able to identify it. However, in some sections, because uh, the other part of the spectacle is on the other side, it's it's uh, you're only seeing a two-dimensional view. You may not see the spectacle, you won't see a nucleus, but you can still identify the cell based on the eosinophilic cytoplasm. This is still an eosinophil. Now, these slightly bigger cells, <clears throat> you can see the nucleus is much more paler than that of a lymphocyte. Say this is a lymphocyte, round blue cell, very dark nucleus. This is a paler nucleus but more slipper shaped and oval. This is a histiocyte, okay? Um, actually, sorry, I'm confusing you a little bit. This is not a histiocyte. I'll tell you why not in a second. Sometimes endothelial cells may actually uh, assume the shape of histiocytes. This is actually a part of the blood vessel cell. So this is actually an endothelial cell. Uh, I wanted to teach you about this and I got confused in the, in the same process. I'll show you a histiocyte later. So this is an endothelial cell, which looks like a histocyte, but this histocyte exactly looks the same. The way you differentiate from a endothelial cell is because it's lining the blood vessel here. You can see how it's lining the blood vessel here. So though it's, this looks like a histocyte, this is just a plump endothelial cell. I'll show you a histocyte in a second. Anyway, let's move on to the, uh, the next quiz first. So what is a diagnosis? Look at the slide properly. <clears throat> uh, look at the nature of the, this is the collagen, obviously. Identify the inflammatory cells here within the section. And then you'll be able to get the diagnosis. Okay, I'll give you two seconds to look at the histological slide, the features before I move on to the question. <clears throat> what is the diagnosis? Your options are granuloma annulare, necrobiosis lipoidica, myxedema, or Wells syndrome. Okay. That's the histology. What is the diagnosis? Now, let's move on to the Kahoot app. Majority, uh, well, not the majority, but yeah, the top answer was scored by a lot of people. So the correct answer is well syndrome. What it's showing is a is a flame figure. Now, some of you have posted a question asking uh, what is uh, the game pin? If you want to still participate, you can. Uh, we still have a few questions. The game pin is visible here, actually, in here. The game pin is 2147417401. You can still log in to Kahoot app and participate if you want to. Anyway, so what is this showing? This uh, particular, oops, sorry. Uh, the histological slide, I'll go back to the slide, is showing a flame figure. Flame figure is where you see degenerated collagen, debris of uh, both eosinophils and neutrophils. The way you identify a flame figure is by seeing the eosinophils. This is all, all eosinophilic, uh, all the eosinophilic uh, debris from the eosinophils. Actually, this is degranulated eosinophilic material from the eosinophils. You can identify the eosinophil here. You can identify eosinophil here. Okay. So when you're seeing eosinophils and you're seeing degenerated collagen, this is actually in the middle of a flame figure. This is not granulomanillary. Granulomanillary, you don't see flame figures, first of all, or you don't see eosinophils. 
Uh, this is not necrobiosis lipoidica. This is not myxedema. There's no mucin there. It's, you're seeing clearly degeneration of collagen. When you're seeing degeneration of collagen, the, probably the closest differential is granulomallary, but granulomallary doesn't look like this. Though there is degenerative collagen and the collagen looks a bit swollen. When you're seeing eosinophils and so much, so many of eosinophils here, the answer is it's a flame figure and flame figures are seen most often in insect bite reactions and also in Bell syndrome where you have lots of eosinophils. All right. Okay. Uh, have we gone to the leaderboard? No. Let's see. Oops. Um, for some reason. Okay. Resume. Right. So leaderboard, what's it looking like? Saumya Navila is still on top, followed by Dr. Ujwal. Savera Gupta, Subhida Kama dropped down a little bit. And then De Sharma, three players have reached answer streak of three. You still see the game pin here if you want to join in. So this is an example of plasma cells which have a cartwheel-shaped uh, nucleus. You can see that here, eccentric cartwheel-shaped nucleus with a uh, eosinophilic. Well, it's not really uh, very eosinophilic as the um, eosinophil. It's more of a basophilic stippling, actually. You see the cytoplasm, but normally in other cells, you don't see the cytoplasm that well. Here you're seeing the cytoplasm and you're seeing this cartwheel-shaped nucleus. Okay, Now, this is a quiz based on what we've already discussed to some extent, but also your theoretical knowledge. There is an eosinophilic blob here in the midst of these cells. If you identify the nature of these cells, you'll be able to guess what this blob is. Okay. So question number nine is asking you what is the arrow pointing at? Okay. So your options are Russell body, splendor of Hopley phenomenon, <clears throat> Cryptococcus or histoplasma. Let's start the quiz. <clears throat> what is the arrow pointing at? Of you, majority of this time have got the answer right. It is indeed a Russell body. Russell body, oops, uh, well, we'll go to the answer streak first. So it's uh, Soumya Navela is still on top, Savera Gupta, Ujwal, Subhida Kamath, and Arvind. Still, we're seeing the same names. Come on, guys, pick up. I want to see some new, main, new names on the leaderboard. So Russell bodies represent a cellular response to overstimulation of plasma cells. So these are all plasma cells, if you'd identify them. And I, that's why I put the slide immediately after the plasma cell demonstration. So this leads to accumulation of uh, abundant non-degradable condensed immunoglobulin uh, within uh, some areas. And this is called um, a Russell body. Okay, Usually you see this in myeloma. You don't see this in <clears throat> other skin conditions usually. Okay. This uh, moves on to the next cell that we may see in the dermis. And this is a mast cell. This is the mast cell here. Typically, you see a fried egg shaped nucleus. That's a cell. That's what we learned here. So, central nucleus, or sometimes maybe eccentric, with the cytoplasm eosinophilic and it looks like a fried egg. Okay. This is a mast cell. Um, once you see this, you won't be able to hopefully forget it. Okay. It has a typical fried egg appearance. I hope you can identify it. Now, normally, I told you. <clears throat> um, Okay, I won't go into this. Sometimes, now, th this is the quiz question. I'll explain what the remaining cells are once we answer the quiz. So, mast cells are sometimes found within some types of tumors. Okay. Based on the mast cells, I want you to identify the tumor in this case. Okay. And your options are, is it a dermatofibroma, spindle cell lipoma, neurofibroma, or lyomyoma? And your quiz starts anytime now. So 31 of you got the answer right, though 39 of you thought it was spindle cell lipoma for some reason. Um, often, mast cells are associated with cutaneous mucinosis and any tumor that may produce uh, mucin. Often, neuroprivoma has some mucin in it, 
and though it's not described in all the textbooks or not not all cases have significant nuisance neurofibroma is a top commonest tumor that has mast cells within it okay so what you're seeing here oops sorry um right okay let me go back to the presentation okay what you're seeing here are these spindle shaped cells in fact these are also the same these are actually spindle shaped cells that are a bit wavy and hopefully you could have made out that these are neural cells here these are the same things, spindle cells are a little bit wavy. And this is actually mucinin between the cells. So this is an example of a myxoid neurofibroma, but even normal neurofibromas can have uh, mucin and um, can have some mucin and can have mast cells within them, okay? So any mucinosis can have mast cells, remember that. Okay, so um, when you have lots of mast cells, these are all mast cells, fried egg appearance, okay? Uh, when you have lots of mast cells, this is called a mastocytoma, okay? Easy diagnosis there. Now, these are, I hope you can easily identify them. These are neutrophils with uh, polymorphs with nuclei which are segmented. And you can see uh, the nice uh, segmentation within the nuclei. These are neutrophils, very easy to identify. Now, here you're seeing histiocytes quite well. I hope you can make out the slipper-shaped uh, nucleus here, which is paler. Now, remember, I told you this can look like an endothelial cell. And this is the endothelial cell here. Okay, you can see the blood vessel here. This is the space here. And lining these are these swollen endothelial cells. These are called high endothelial cells when the cells of the endothelium are swollen. Normally, they're quite flat and spindle-shaped. Okay, but in inflammatory conditions, non-specific, this is not related to one particular inflammatory condition. In inflammatory conditions, the endothelial cells can become quite swollen. When they're called high endothelial cells, you may come across this, come across this when you're reading. Uh, papers, etc. But this is a histiocyte with with this, um, <clears throat> which has a similar type, a similar type of nucleus. It's like it's like a slipper shaped nucleus. When histiocytes join together, they form a giant cell. Okay, and you're seeing small lymphocytes in between as well. Obviously, this is a granuloma. Now I told you about foamy histiocytes. This is an example of foamy histiocytes of leprosy. You're seeing uh, you know, globi. Um, some people may say, how can you say the globi without uh, a fight for or, or AFB staining? But yes, I can identify them even on HNE because that's what clumps of bacilli sometimes look like on uh, HNE itself. Okay. Now, the other type of spindle cells that you may see are fibrocytes. I told you earlier, especially seen in some conditions like dermatofibroma, for example. So you're seeing these spindle shaped cells are fibrocytes. Now, here is an example of a flattened endothelial cell, which is much more uh, denser nucleus. It's not as paler as before, okay? So, this is a slide showing you the actual endothelial cells, which is actually quite flat and lining the, um, <clears throat> the blood vessel here. Okay. Now, I've shown this slide already. Question number 11, which of these statements is true, okay? Only one of these is true. The presence of plasma cell, cells in any inflammatory lesion is suggestive of syphilis. Mast cells are present in cutaneous mucinosis. The presence of even a few plasma cells in a penile biopsy is suggestive of Zunz bellitis. The presence of eosinophils in a skin biopsy is highly specific for a drug eruption. I hope you're going to get this answer right because some of this has already been discussed. Let us resume this. Right. that mast cells are present in mucinosis. I'm disappointed that some of you have got the answer wrong. Plasma cells do not always suggest syphilis. They can be present non-specifically. If you have lots of them, you can be, it, it, it is not uh, suggestive of syphilis all the time unless there's clinical correlation. Plasma cells are actually quite non-specific, though when you're seeing lots of them and you don't have any other differential, you may think of syphilis. Um, even a few plasma cells are not enough to diagnose zones because Plasma cells can normally be present in the mucosal areas, okay? And mucosal area is where you get syphilitic lesions. So just because you have plasma cells doesn't mean it's syphilis because even a normal mucosal biopsy of any inflammatory condition can have plasma cells. You need to have lots of plasma cells to diagnose something as plasma cell, bellitis or plasma cell vulvitis, which is what? Zoon's diseases. 
Eosinophils, unfortunately, are not specific for drug eruptions. Eosinophils are quite non-specific. In fact, some studies have actually shown that neutrophils are maybe more specific. Eosinophils can suggest it. Drug reactions can have eosinophils, but just Basic pathophysiology. So we're not yeah. uh, discussing that. Uh, you right. resume, sir, please. Okay, okay, right. So um, how do I evaluate a slide? The way I evaluate a slide is based on a few things. First, I evaluate a low power, and that's how I would recommend uh, doing it, and that's what how I was taught. The first thing to identify is identify the site of biopsy. And don't just look at the form, because I don't actually look at the referral form when I'm looking at slides, because that tends to bias your mind. And once your mind is biased, you don't tend to, you only tend to look at what you think you're going to see. You miss the things that you're supposed to see in the slide. So I don't normally look at the requisition form. I look at the slide blind. And first I try to identify the site. And why is it important? I'll tell you in a second. Then determine whether it's inflammatory, non-inflammatory. Look at the distribution of inflammation, the tissue reaction pattern, make a provisional diagnosis and go then, then go to higher power, look at the slide and then look at the requisition form, then confirm a diagnosis. But I'll discuss each of these one by one. So like the elephant, you know, and the blind man's story, the context matters. And therefore, if you're not, don't know what site you're looking at, you miss the diagnosis a lot of times or you overdiagnose things. For example, is this biopsy normal? You'd This is a nice square shaped biopsy with thick collagen and the appendages structures are hardly seen. Okay. Is this biopsy normal? By textbook, this is a case of morphia. But then, this is a normal biopsy from the trunk, and you need to understand that on the trunk, the epidermis, the, the dermis is quite thick. It looks like morphia and appendages structures are off. Yeah, unless yeah. Secondly, if you have a morphic lesion, if you have a choice take a biopsy from a non-trunkal area because if you take it from the trunk, the biopsy would look like morphia anyway. So you have a chance of over-diagnosis. Okay? So that's very important to know why, not, how normal skin looks like. And then, you know, look at this. Is this biopsy normal? Say, for example, this is a biopsy from the eyelid, for example. This may be normal because you're seeing fat such so high in the epidermis. But if you're seeing this biopsy, say, from the buttock, this is nuvus cutaneous lipomatosis superficialis, where the fat is located high up in the dermis. Okay, so you need to know what is normal. Why is it important to know site specific variations? To not diagnose disease in normal skin, to narrow down the differentials because some diseases are only present in some areas. You can't diagnose, uh, for example, uh, pomphalix if you have a biopsy from the face, right? And to identify possible specimen mix up, that is very important. Because it happens, person mix up, even though we try very hard, it may happen at the time of biopsy, you may take two biopsies from two different patients and the nurse may label it wrongly. Send it to us. You're seeing acryl skin here, then you know that there's a specimen mix up. Okay, So you need to know the site specific variations in anatomy. Now, this, I told you earlier, when you're seeing a thick stratum corneum, which is compacted, you think acryl, okay? And you know it's acryl. When you know it's acryl, you know the diagnosis is pomphalix. This is pangeotic dermatitis. This is dyshydrotic eczema. You're seeing the eczema here. You're seeing vesicles within the epidermis. And when you know it's acryl skin, this is a diagnosis of pomphalix. And acryl skin, the other typical feature, because the epidermis is so thick, you see this, you see this acrine duct opening, the acrosyringeal opening, which spirals up. Okay, and opens onto the surface. You don't see this in normal skin and uh, non acryl skin. You see this only in acryl skin. So once you know the site, you already know the diagnosis before the even seeing the requisition form. Okay, it's so easy. <clears throat> so now, this is a quiz question. Identify the site of biopsy. This is normal skin. Okay, don't think this is abnormal skin. This is normal skin. Identify the site of biopsy, and this is what the histology looks like. I'm telling you, this is normal skin. Don't try to make a diagnosis out of it. This is normal skin in one particular area of the body. 
and the choices are ear helix, nose, chin, or scalp. And your quiz starts now. Right. Uh, of you have got the answer right. You're seeing lots of sebaceous glands here, and this is the nose. Okay, it's not the ear, helix, chin, or scalp. This is the nose because you're seeing sebaceous hyperplasia. Sebaceous hyperplasia can be present even normally in the on the nose. Okay, so let's see what the leaderboard looks like. Uh, so Vega Gupta is still leading, followed by Arvind, Srividya, Bhartika, and Suvida Kamat. Okay, excellent. So here goes to the next question now. This is a lesion since birth. Identify the likely site of the biopsy. This is a lesion. This is not normal skin this time. Question number 13. This is a lesion since birth, likely site of biopsy. And I've given you the exact same histology. Okay, exact same histology. Now, this time I'm telling you it's a lesion and I'm asking you to identify the site of biopsy. Okay, let's go to the actual quiz now. This is just to make you familiar with the biopsy. So it's obviously a uh, congenital lesion. This is an epidermis. This is a sebaceous nevus. Okay. The way, the, the, how you identify sebaceous nevus, you see sebaceous gland hyperplasia. And also you're seeing the sebaceous glands directly opening onto the surface. This may happen in a nose where there's sebaceous hyperplasia, but doesn't happen when you have a lesion. In a lesion, it should not happen. Okay. It may happen in an elderly person with sebaceous hyperplasia. But I've told you this is a lesion since birth. Sebaceous hyperplasia doesn't happen since birth unless it's a nevus sebaceous. Okay, so the answer is nevus sebaceous, and the commonest side of nevus sebaceous is the scalp. So the answer is the scalp, not the ear, helix, nose, or chin. Let's see who's leading. So Arvind has gone on to the top, followed by Srividya, Sevega Gupta, Bhartika, and Soumya Narula. Right, a few new names. We've got a few more questions to go. So, um, yeah, so lesion since birth, likely site of biopsy, we've already answered that. Okay, so this is what normal scalp skin should look like. Lots of terminal hair follicles on vertical section. Very few sebaceous glands. Uh, you don't have this. So when you're seeing that, it's nevus sebaceous. Now here, you're, the, the site is the ear. You're seeing the cartilage here. This is what cartilage looks like. If you remember your basic anatomy. So this is what cartilage looks like. When you're seeing the cartilage, you know that you're dealing with the ear. And you're seeing a few vellus hair follicles as well. So this is what normal skin on the face may look like. You're seeing lots of uh, vellus hair follicles here, sebaceous glands, thin epidermis, not so thick dermis. So this is what a biopsy, normal biopsy. Well, it's not normal biopsy, but this is what a this is a, from a um, inflammatory lesion. But this is what a biopsy from the cheek or somewhere on the face would look like. This is what mucosal skin would look like. We've already discussed that. This is a biopsy from probably the arm where the dermis is slightly more thicker. And you're seeing some hair follicles. It's not as thick as in the in trunk. I showed you the trunk biopsy is much more squared up and very few hair follicles. Here you're seeing more number of hair follicles. So it's usually, it's probably the arm or something like that. This, these pink structures on cross section, this is the darter's muzzle. And you're seeing dart, this you're seeing muzzle within a section. You should think either genital area. So it's either the scrotum. Or it could also be the clitoris or, you know, labia majora can also have muscle within it. So, gentle area, gentle skin, okay? This is the darter's muscle. This is scrotum, actually. This pink homogeneous stuff in the dermis is actually solar elastosis. Once you've seen it, it looks smudged. The collagen all looks degenerate and smudged. This is the appearance of solar elastosis. This is marked solar elastosis. This is a severe case, but often it is quite subtle in Indian skin. But when you're seeing solar elastosis, you know that it is a photo exposed area. Okay. So at least you can identify that based on the presence of solar elastosis. It's very easy to diagnose solar elastosis. 
Question 14. Identify the site based on the diagnosis. So based on the diagnosis, you have to identify the commonest site where this diagnosis may present in. Now the diagnosis is very straightforward. If you've seen at least one slide in your, uh, or you open the textbook and read about this condition, this is a very typical slide of this uh, entity. Okay, so let's start the quiz. Identify the site. Your options are as follows. Number, add, go ahead, or follow. Answering for some reason, uh, um, the answer is vulva because the diagnosis is lichen sclerosis. Okay, so this is a typical case of lichen sclerosis. You see the homogeneous collagen, uh, you know, in the upper dermis. And um, let's see what the leaderboard looks like. So in the top is Savega Gupta, followed by Arvind, Srividya, Soumya Nagar, and Batika. So I think realistically, if unless Savega Gupta gets the next question wrong. Um, she and Arvind will be the contenders, but let's see. You may, you may be surprised. So you've got the last question to go, um, but that's not yet. So the next step, I've already discussed aside. Next step is the distribution of inflammation. The inflammation can be just superficial and perivascular, most often seen in inflammatory dermatosis like uh, epidermal inflammation like psoriasis, you see in the eczema or lichen planus, the inflammation is just superficial, okay? So this is a superficial perivascular type of inflammation, okay? Usually associated with epidermal inflammatory diseases, like psoriasis. Next is superficial and deep. And in superficial and deep, this is a particular type of inflammation where you're seeing these, the nuclear dust around the blood vessels. This is an example of a vasculitis, okay? So the first type of distribution is only superficial. Then you have superficial and deep vasculitis. And, uh, and this is superficial and deep perivascular vasculitis. This is from Ackerman's uh, algorithm, and this is a very good algorithm to follow if you're trying to evaluate a biopsy. Because if you have any superficial perivascular, you're dealing with epidermal diseases, if superficial and deep, then you have uh, vasculitis, then you're dealing with a vasculitic condition. Next is superficial and deep, right? Perivascular, no vasculitis, okay? Superficial and deep, perivascular, no vasculitis. Now, this is the last quiz question. Okay. Uh, I have a few more slides to teach, but if you're only interested in the quiz, this is the last quiz question. But I won't discuss the, I won't tell you the who's the leader unless the, the talk is over. So the question is superficial and deep perivascular infiltrate, non vasculitic. Which of the following is not a differential diagnosis? Which of the following is not a differential diagnosis? Your options are pleva, viral exanthems, Jessen's lymphocytic infiltrate, or tumid lupus. Okay. And here starts the quiz. Is actually Priva, um, particularly based on the histology I showed you earlier, because the histology I showed you earlier had no virtually no epidermal involvement. Priva is a vascular interface dermatitis, though you may see superficial and deep infiltrate, usually well shaped, not as um, remarkable as in the case I've shown you here. Okay, so the case I showed you here is uh, definitely not that of Priva because the epidermis is completely normal if you've seen it. Cleva, usually inflammation is confined here. You don't have such deep infiltrates. This can be seen either in viral exanthems, drug reactions, tumid lupus, or chestnuts, which is a variant of lupus according to some people. Okay. So I'm not going to uh, show you the leaderboard yet unless we finish the quiz. Hopefully that will keep you engaged till the end. But we don't got many more slides to go. So superficial and deep, non masculatic here, differential, sometimes erythema annular, centripetal also the differential. Then you have superficial and deep nodular infiltrates often seen in granulomatous and lymphomatous conditions. This is an example of uh, tuberculoid Hansen's, and this is an example of lymphoma, where you may see this. And this is an example of diffuse interstitial infiltrate. 
often seen in lepermatous leprosy or this is an example of the lymphoma again, okay? So you have superficial, so the types of distribution of inflammation you had either superficial, sufficient and deep perivascular, vasculitic, non-vasculitic, perivascular and nodular, granulomatous or lymphomatous, or diffuse interstitial. Then you have Swedes, Hansen's lymphoma, etc. Then the, the next type of inflammation is a paniculitis, this is a fat. And then next is a folliculitis or a perifolliculitis. Okay. So this is how you classify distribution of inflammation. That's how you narrow down the differentials. Then we come to the tissue reaction patterns, which we'll discuss in the next uh, few talks uh, as we go along in the next in the remaining part of the year. So tissue reaction patterns are six basic tissue reaction patterns. One is the lichenoid pattern you're seeing here. Where you're seeing nice colloid bodies of lichen planus. Here you're seeing the seraziform pattern with clubbing of retinages, superpapillary thinning, paracritosis, subconjunct neutrophils. You're seeing the spongiotic pattern here, okay? Uh, here you're seeing nice spongiosis. with the granulomatous pattern here, okay? You're seeing the granulomas being formed here, okay? Then you have, this is a close-up of a granuloma. Then you have the vasculitic pattern, which I've discussed earlier. This is a blood vessel with vasculitis, neutrophilic dust, fibrinoid vessel wall change. So this are, these are the six basic tissue reaction patterns, okay? Then you have the vesicular bullous pattern, of course, which I haven't shown you a slide of, but we'll discuss that as we go along. So uh, once we once we took at the inflammatory, non-inflammatory pattern, tissue reaction type, you already arrived at the prevalent diagnosis, but then you look at the higher power for type of inflammatory cells, which again will give you a clue, and I've discussed that already, and then I usually arrive at a final diagnosis. Okay. Once I've arrived, I can correlate. I call the clinician or, uh, you know, send them a message and say, listen, this is not correlating. These are histological findings. Please see if uh, there's a specimen mix up. I'll look at the mix up on my end. If there's still no mix up, ask them to repeat a biopsy or try to discuss with them and see if there are any other clinical differentials that may fit in with the histology that we see. Okay. So, um, if there are any questions, I'm ready to answer. In the meanwhile, uh, I could just put this message here. I have a Dermpath uh, WhatsApp group where we have a group of uh, interested Dermpath enthusiasts where we post interesting cases, also some teaching cases. So if you're interested in joining the group, you can uh, feel free to message me on my WhatsApp number. I've uh, put up the number here. Oops. Uh, if the number, I'm not sure if the number is visible. Let me see if... Uh, right. Okay, just a second. Yeah. So a message. Visible, to, uh, visible to talk to one That's fine. Okay. So the WhatsApp number is visible here. You can message me if you want to join the group. So next comes to the leaderboard time. Let's see who's uh, finally won the quiz. Oh, we got a poll actually. Please read the session before we end. Please read the session. or you want um, anything else included in the session, please feel free to uh, message me in the chat. Well, so let's see who's eating. And the first question is the uh, And the third thing is the Thank you all for joining. Uh, 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 uh,
questions. And uh, thank you very much. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Venkat. It was really excellent, uh, you know, exercise. Even I, I enjoyed and I was thrilled to, you know, take up the quiz. Although because of the net issue, I could not complete the you know, entire questionnaire, but it was excellent. I think as we move along, this 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 will you know find more uh, viewership. So great, uh, great uh, going, and all the best. Thank Thanks. you very much for for you know conducting this in a very nice manner. It was very engaging and in fact very mm -hmm. gripping. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So then. Uh, we, we we can call it a day then. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sir, in between we need to we need to announce regarding uh, numbers. Acha, Arvind, you can stop recording and live. So we'll discuss one minute and then we'll, you sure. should stop live. Arvind.